Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us uh, live from London today, which is very exciting. We're going to have a great episode today. Thanks for uh, being here. Our goal is to provide a forum where startup people can get their questions answered. So whether you're a startup founder and you're thinking about starting a company, uh, you might be deciding if you're going to take a job at a company, whatever it might be, if you have a question about startups, we're going to try and, uh, and help you out. Uh, this is a live show and we want to hear from you. So uh, we want you to call us or email us or tweet at us so we can answer your questions. So from the US, you can call us toll free 1-844-4-FOUNDER. That's 844-436-8633. From Europe, you can call us directly. It's 1-602-753-1673. Uh, uh, That's 1-602-753-1628. The email address is help at founderline.com or you can tweet to at Founderline and we'll try and uh, get your questions answered. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is Roberto Bonanzinga, who's a partner at Balderton Capital, which is where we're located today here in London. Uh, Roberto's an old friend. He's worked both in the US and in Europe, and he's an investor in uh, many companies, including uh, Vivino, Wuga, and Banjo. Roberto, welcome, and thank you for joining us on Founderline. Thank you to you, and welcome to you to London. Right? That's thank you. The uh, first time we are together in London. I, exactly. Uh, the last time we were together was in Italy. We uh, we both are uh, of it, uh, Italian heritage, and uh, I was lucky enough to get over there uh, last summer and meet you in Sicily, which That's was an right. amazing, uh, amazing time. So, um, so usually before we uh, dive into questions. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time getting to know our guests and just um, generally chatting and finding out more about them. So um, it'd be great to get a little bit of background. You, you've been lucky enough to work, have worked both in Silicon Valley as well as now here in Europe uh, for how long now? How, how long have you been working in Europe? So uh, I came back from the US in 2000. Okay, so 14 long, years. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time. We are getting older. I, uh, <laughs> believe me, I, I feel it every day. So, um, uh, so I'm curious, you know, I, I don't know the startup scene here very well. And since you've lived through both, it's changed a l quite a bit in the yeah. States, as you know. You, you go back all the yeah. time. But um, maybe you can tell us how entrepreneurship and startups uh, are different in the, in the two areas, Europe uh, or maybe London specifically and, uh, and Silicon Valley. No, I think uh, the point you just made is interesting, right? Is Europe or London? And, uh, you know, I think uh, something uh, to remember is that uh, the Europe, it's a lot of different type of things. And uh, I don't think there is such thing as a European entrepreneurship. I think there is a type of entrepreneurship that gets connotated in each different country. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest richness of uh, Europe is the fact that you have the UK, you have Germany, Sweden, all of these are you know, it's not like they are like states in the US, they are standalone countries with their own ecosystems, you know, their own GDPs, their own drivers of growth and everything like that. So, you know, one thing for all of us never to forget is that uh, there is no one single ecosystem that is the European ecosystem, but there are a multitude of ecosystems. I would say no, even in some cases at the country level, but even at the city level. Really? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the ecosystem of Berlin and the ecosystem of Munich, they are, they are quite different. And, you know, I would make the argument that uh, this is basically very true for the rest of Europe, too. And if there is something that I've seen, that, of which I'm obviously fairly excited, is when, you know, I moved here in 2000 from, from the Bay Area, um, and I was going around, you know, my friends were asking me, you know, what do you do? And, you know, I work in startups, I have to, to do with startups. People couldn't really place that. What is it? You know, what does it really mean? People here. People here, right? And I remember, you know, but oh, wow, it's a type of company. What, what does it really mean? And I think uh, one thing that we have been for sure achieved in Europe in the last, you know, 15 years is uh, now, you know, entrepreneurship is becoming, you know, a topic that 
is really becoming more and more mass market. You know, you hear that on television. Really? You hear it uh, all over it. Yes, because, you know, entrepreneurship is seen as a, a potential significant engine of growth for a region of Europe that, uh, you know, as the United States, which we are for sure significantly more challenging in growth that we have never been in the past. Yeah, yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, everything is becoming a little bit significantly more mainstream. Hmm. And at the same time, the other point that I, I think is important, you know, this is you really see companies and entrepreneurs, you know, popping up everywhere in Europe. So it's true, you know, that there are some ecosystems a little bit more advanced than others. But it's also true that I really believe the next big thing could start pretty much everywhere in Europe, you know, from, you know, Barcelona to Milan to Stockholm. Then there is a different question. Maybe we can talk about that later. Independently from where it starts, you know, where is the best place where you can grow it? Because mm. obviously growth is a function of your capability to attract talent and many other things. So there are some for sure there are some parts in Europe where that is a bit easier. Like a little bit of a yeah. technology yeah. hub, like yeah. London has obviously developed Yeah, I mean, Lo London is a bit of that. I think Berlin is a bit of that. I think, you know, Stockholm is a bit of that. I think uh, Helsinki is a bit of that. I think Tallinn is a bit of that. Is it not funny? Already I mentioned five. Yeah. And it's also interesting to see how some of these ecosystems have very little to do with the size of the town or of the country. You know, Finland is... Uh, the whole country is 5 million people, still is extremely fervid in terms of entrepreneurship. Wow. It's amazing. I, and I, I think about the US and just, you know, New York is not the same as Silicon Valley, although it, it's evolved quite a bit, but it can't be nearly the difference yeah. that you see with Helsinki versus, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, look, I remember this when I came back from, from the US as an operator. And, you know, I was always dealing with these uh, issues of talking to my friends in the U.S., you know, how difficult it was uh, to build a sales force capable to sell in San Francisco, and then you need to deal a sales force capable to sell in New York, how different is, you know, the East Coast from the West Coast. Right. Do you guys speak the same language? Use the same currencies, <laughs> is the same television, the same type of same culture, laws, <laughs> same laws, right. same everything. Think about the level of complexity when you go in a place where to build a sales force in Germany is a fairly different thing to do than build one in Italy or in, in the UK. Got it. Right. Interesting. Well, so one of the other things that's really changed is the way companies get funded, and it used to be. You know, 10 years ago, um, guys would walk into um, a VC with a PowerPoint deck and maybe a founding team of three or whatever it is, and they'd raise $3 million, right? And that would be essentially their seed money to go f figure out what they're doing and go. And, and the advent of, you know, the micro VCs as well as Kickstarter and AngelList, um, that's really changed the economics, at least in Silicon Valley. Now, you know, they want you to have raised some money already from friends and family, maybe have a working product like uh, that's taking off and going like crazy. So I'm curious how that's happening over here. Uh, Balderton, I don't, I don't know if you guys do both seed as well as, you know, series A's and B's, but uh, maybe talk about how that's evolved and how it might be different than some of the stuff you see going on in the States right now. So, you know, Balderton main focus is in the early stage space. Um, I would say our bread and butter is the round A's. That's where we start to get like involved. Like a $3 million yeah. A or something but like that? But the truth is, you know, we have been always very um, opportunistically driven. So if we find a great entrepreneur that is working on something needs less cash, it, but that's the stage in which the company is, we will probably do it. If he needs a bit more cash, we'll do it. We tend to be more opportunistically driven based on a very specific formula of percentage of the fund that we need to invest on anything. Okay. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the question you raise, I mean, there are no doubts that uh, um, I think uh, the ecosystems are evolving and changing. As you just mentioned, in the US, we have seen a lot of interesting phenomena in that space. Do I see something similar happening in Europe? The answer to that question is yes. But there is also an important point that must be clear. Uh, because I always get, you know, this comparison, okay, between the US and Europe, you know, what's the difference, yeah, how they're yeah. similar and so on. The truth is that I, I don't, you know, overall Europe as an ecosystem for European tech entrepreneurship in general, I would say, is uh, 
you know, significantly less developed, has got less history. Yeah. You know, I mean, so a lot of things that have been significantly more proven and advanced in Europe, in, so in the US, you know, we are starting, you know, here with some elements of delays. Now, this was, uh, I would say that these two lines, the delays of this, you know, Europe versus US is obviously, you know, getting converging in the meaning that I see obviously the speed to which Europe is catching up is very fast, but it's still a different type of ecosystem in a different stage of life. I think that must be very clear. Okay. So to your question is, uh, do we see people using more Kickstarter? So the answer to this question is, yes, of course we see it. Do we see, you know, angel list is trying to come to Europe and get regulated by the European uh, regulators? And the answer, yes, we see all of that is happening too. Um, but obviously, it will happen all in a different way. I think that is the important point at the end of it. Yeah, yeah. It's less about replicating what has been working in the US and try to replicate it here. I think it's more about taking advantage of the uniqueness of Europe and, uh, and exploiting it. Okay. So we see all the different phenomena, but all take a little bit of a different type of shape. I would say that's the way to look at it. So that's a little bit about maybe some of the funding things. What about um, technology trends? Uh, any any interesting things going on here? I know you focus primarily on consumer related, yeah. what social social media related things. SaaS, or? consumer internet, mobile. I've been done a little bit of everything. So marketplace. Um, again, I, I actually don't think there is something where Europeans uh, have special different right i think uh, if you look at some uh, you know our our last exit you know was natural motion we sold it to zynga that was a gaming company um do i think uh, europeans are better than everybody else in games Pro probably not if you look also some of the public success you know i'm just thinking some of the other companies have been ipo lately you know one in the ad tech space you know one is in the marketplace space i don't think there is a, a europeanness of, okay, these type of things started in Europe. Um, and I, I, I think uh, entrepreneurship doesn't follow any rules. Yes. And I think, uh, who knows, right? Skype started here. Does it mean that we have uh, an age on VoIP? I'm, I'm not sure this is true anymore. Okay. I think everything is becoming significantly more global. And I would say significantly more mobile, but not mobile in the device sense of mobile, but in fact, you know, migrating and moving. I think we are moving more into what are called migrating entrepreneurs. You know, this is an interesting phenomenon. I think we are observing where entrepreneurs start somewhere and then when they need to grow their business, they move in the place where it makes most sense. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, and it was interesting on the drive over here. I, I tried Uber to see how it would work in London and I had a nice chat with the driver and uh, it's very interesting how it's disrupting, you know, the taxis. What is it called? The black car? Black car. Yeah, yeah. the black car people are very upset. And there's some of that going on back in the States as That's well. That's some but amazing. But for it's at the same time, you have also some European companies. There is one called Halo that is not one of our investment, but has been adapting, if you wish, the concept of Uber to, to the black cab world. Right? Ah. So you see elements of this adaptation all the time. Makes sense. Um, well, he was he was just talking about how the the black car drivers are not happy with the Uber drivers, like they don't like them, and they they get paid to recruit other drivers to come to Uber, and it was it was a very interesting conversation. Yeah, it's the same Ten conversation. Minutes. If you go to New York, you talk to a yellow cab driver. Yeah, same have thing. Discussions huh? yeah. about Uber. Yeah, <laughs> They're probably not gonna be delighted. That's right. That's but, right. You know, that's what innovation does. All right, good. Well, um, that's a little bit, uh, you know, just about what's going on here, and. Um, we're gonna uh, try and answer some questions. So once again, if, uh, if you wanna call us from the US, you can call 1-844-4-FOUNDER. That's 844-436-8633. From Europe, you can call 1-602-753-1628. Uh, I hope we get some calls from Europe, but uh, you never know with, with uh, this time of day. And you and can also, up. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, you can uh, email help at founderline.com or you can tweet to at founderline, and we're, uh, we're keeping an eye on those uh, as they come in. So, um, first question uh, came in from uh, Massimo over email. 
So Massimo asks, what's your opinion about the Italian startup ecosystem? So something uh, probably close to your heart, right? Uh, yeah, being Italian. So what can I say? The Italian startup ecosystem, so if the level of maturity of the European startup ecosystem is less mature than the American one, obviously the Italian one is probably less mature than many of the other European. So I think there is a lot of work to be done there. But at the same time, you know, there are some pretty impressive success that have been happening. You know, we invested in a company a long time ago, you know, five, six, seven years ago now, called Ux. It was an e-commerce company. These guys helped you know, Armani and Dolce Gabbana to fundamentally start selling on the internet. Hmm. You know, the company that did extremely well, start in Italy, look at all, you know, world, the market, global markets, and, you know, is today publicly quoted in the Italian stock exchange. I think it's worth something in the neighborhood, $1.5 billion, $2 billion. Wow. Um, so what can I tell you about the, the Italian ecosystem? It is a less mature ecosystem, but despite that, it doesn't mean that there, is not, there, there are not great opportunities there, right? So it's more about uh, figure out uh, what is that you want to do, figure out if uh, you know, it makes sense to build a company for the Italian market or makes sense to build a company from Italy for a global market. And, um, and uh, you know, take advantage of the situation. What I can tell you is even, uh, you know, in Italy that again, I, I believe there is a bit less going on that for instance in Berlin or in London, um, there is a clear change of public perception around the opportunity for uh, tech entrepreneurship. Really? Yeah, even uh, just, uh, you know, reading, uh, you know, the newspapers and all of that. But, you know, one thing is perception, one thing is reality. So what does Italy need? It's uh, another Nicolas Zenstrom. Ah. <laughs> so, but they do, I mean, you know, I'll give you an example. The guys from Buongiorno did a fantastic job starting a company in Italy, growing it outside of Italy, and, you know, eventually they got acquired from the guys at NTT Docomo. You know, the guys at Dada did a fantastic job to start a company from scratch, take it public, and so on. Virgilio, you know, um, so there are some great examples of, of, you know, Italian entrepreneurs, they've done great things. They just, we need more. And, uh, and it's important, I think, that the more established entrepreneurs become more visible because they become a source of inspiration sure. for the youngers. Yeah. You know, what, um, I, I don't know the Italian ecosystem well, is, is, are there specific cities where a lot of this is happening, like in Roma, or is, is it all over the place? It can Again, come from anywhere. Italy is pretty complicated because, you know, in, in Mini it's quite fragmented geographically. There yeah. are lots of cities of a certain scale. Yeah. Historically, you know, Milan, Torino, um, and uh, uh, Florence, believe it or not, wow. actually, and uh, I mean, I think and I'm thinking about uh, also Rome, just uh, thinking of Venere, that was a great example of a, a website uh, focused on uh, e-commerce for tourism. So, which makes sense, like Rome, uh, lots of tourists, yeah, maybe. I'm not uh, sure, to be honest, I think it happened. Yeah. That the entrepreneurs were there and they started That's just there where from. more than any the ends. Um, and maybe, you know, it will be helpful if there will be more of a hub in Italy. But I don't think, again, you can change that, right? So that's the, that's the way how Italy operates. Yeah, right? it's yeah. Very yeah. A bit spread, regional, right? Yeah. More regional. So you, you like, probably... You know, Lux started in Bologna. Oh, yeah? The, you know, yeah. that is very famous for food. Well, and that's in Milano, <laughs> I get, yeah. from e-commerce yeah. and the brands, yeah. that, you know, the fashion yeah. labels and yeah. all that. So you, you probably get... Um, people coming to you from all over the place, right? Yeah. Europe, I know you're in, you, you invested in Banjo, which yeah. is Redwood City, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so um, how, do, how do you handle that? Like, you, you can't just, you know, hop down to, uh, you know, Milano. I, I, guess, I guess you could on a regular basis. So you must, you must use some filtering process to decide, or, or are most of the companies here in London that Balderton works on? No, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, this is an interesting discussion. I think there are two things happening. First of all, um, I actually do believe uh, that, uh, you know, personally, a significant amount of my work has been around what they call the round walk. 
So actually, you know, every time I go in a place, and I may go in a place, you know, because I may be visiting a company or because I may be have a board meeting of one of my company, I always try to tap into the local entrepreneurial ecosystem and trying to meet you know, the key guys and trying to organize maybe a small event with young entrepreneurs. And I do that proactively, even if in some cases there is not a deal. So you know, if it happens that I need to be in Milan for some things, I always try to connect with that. Okay, how can I meet as many interesting entrepreneurs as possible? I see. When I go to Berlin, you know, for board meetings, I always try to attend, you know, one day more so that I can actually smell the scene. I am a big believer of that. Yeah. On one side, and I've been done a lot of that historically, and. And that's why, you know, if you think about uh, some of the investments we have done, also the ones I've done in my portfolio, you know, some are in Sweden, uh, Copenhagen, Berlin, it's quite spread yeah. geographically. Yeah. But the second thing I think more importantly is uh, there is a lot of today that can be done with technology. Right? So I always uh, get um, approached by entrepreneurs that tell me, you know, what's the best way to get in touch with me? In today's world, I mean, to get in touch with me, go on Twitter, yeah. you know, go on Facebook, use any element of, you know, communication. Guess which one could be my nickname on Skype and, and just bombard me. I actually like to be bombarded because to me, the way how you bombard me is already saying something about who you are and what you do. Like this person is a hustler. And no, they no, figured out how to get to me. It means something, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the way how they position what they're doing, yeah. right? And you know, what, the thing I love the most is people that contact me on Twitter. Somehow they engage me and they show me a prototype through Twitter. How smart is that? Yeah. Because not only it's a way how they engage in my attention, if you wish, even outside of my inbox, but more importantly, they are making that public. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, that is so. Doing that it means that not only everybody else is watching, also the fact that I'm watching that thing, right? That I be per se, I think yeah. it's quite interesting. So, have you funded a deal off of Twitter? Divino. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. It was, they get, they originally reached no, out. No, I reached them. Oh, okay. Out on Twitter because yeah. I actually saw, you know, Vivino was a great example of a company I actually thought was an American company. I just didn't pay enough attention. I'm, I, I was in the US. A friend showed to me. And he told me, you know, it's an American company. They only have uh, American wines, uh, crappy wines. You know, for Europeans, American wines are not good. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I think the people so <laughs> in Napa Valley might have something to say about that. <laughs> well, it depends. Right? If you are b used to Barolo, yes, I think even yes. those guys might agree with you. Yes, yes. But anyway, so anyway, the joke was, uh, so in my mind, I never registered with me. You know, I thought, okay, some, you know, Napa Valley, yeah, you know. Discount wine. Discount wine. <laughs> and then at some point, actually, because of some friends, some connection to it, uh, I saw a tweets about Vivino being Copenhagen. That's how I found out. Okay. So that's something that I think. And then, you know, last piece is, uh, in the, you know, you mentioned in the past, um, just before, how the world of venture is changing because of platform. I also think there is a, a huge opportunity for the world of venture to evolve because of data. Because if you think about the way how the internet works and all these different platforms, and therefore all these startups they start, they all become somehow visible and all them, I would say, leave traces on the internet. So one thing that right now is significantly fascinating my brain is how can you make sense of those traces on the internet about startups as a way to detect signals? And, and figure out if it's a good investment. And figure out through signals a new approach to discovery. Huh. That's cool. That's something that fascinates me quite a lot. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Well, good. Well, hopefully, hopefully we answered uh, Massimo's uh, question. Um, we're going to move on to the next question here from uh, Michael. Uh, it was an email that came in. What advantage are what advantages are there to starting up a company in England or Europe as opposed to the U.S.? Maybe it's legal, regu regulatory, financial uh, resources like hiring. Um, so you've seen both sides. Uh, what what are the advantages over I, here? I don't think it's a question of advantages or disadvantages. To me, it's always a question of matching. Given the problem you're trying to solve, where is the best place to do so? 
and you know also what is your co competence into that so i give you an example right? if you want to start uh, something that uh, you know, address you know the European market or you address the UK market. It probably makes significant more sense, even if you are start the company in Italy. If you want to address the UK market, it might make some sense for you to move actually to the UK. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's less about figure out okay here are the pro the cons. It's more figure out okay depend based on what is the the entrepreneur in this case want to do. What is the business idea? Where is the best place to locate the company? on one side. On the other side, based on the entrepreneur's network, where is the best chance entrepreneurs got to attract talent? Because at the end, let's don't forget, right, that one of the key things that everybody always try to minimize, but becomes the most important bottleneck to growth, is the capability of a company to attract talent. Exactly. And, you know, if you have, you know, zero network, uh, you are starting from scratch, you may want to think twice before moving somewhere else, right? So it's a, it depends on the idea, depends on the opportunity, depends on the angle of the market, uh, it depends on the network of the entrepreneurs and or the people around the entrepreneur, you know, the investors, the, the advisors and everybody like that. Yeah. I wish there would be such a black and white formula that says, if you do this, then you locate the company here. I'm not sure that works. Makes sense. Well, given the earlier things we talked about, it sounds uh, sounds good. Um, so um, we need to take a moment and uh, thank our sponsors. So relax, have a have a drink. Uh, uh, I'll just remind you again, you know, to call and to uh, email and to tweet at us. Uh, the phone numbers uh, from from the U.S. one eight four 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 founder. From Europe, one six zero two seven five three one six two eight. Uh, email help at founderline.com or tweet to at founderline and we'll see if we can uh, if we can help you out so uh, this show wouldn't be possible without the support that we receive from our two amazing sponsors Ustream and Auric and uh, I'll start with Ustream we're uh, streaming this live from London and it was a bit of an experiment I had to basically create a TV studio in a box I call it and uh, called the guys up over at Ustream and, and talked to them about what's the best way to do this. And uh, about the only challenge we had was uh, having to do it in 720 as opposed to 1080p because of the limitation on my, my MacBook CPU, believe it or not. But uh, it's amazing. You, you can load up a suitcase full of equipment and uh, go broadcast a show from wherever you want to. Uh, it w just using your laptop, and in our case, we have some extra stuff because of the calls and the microphones, but uh, really straightforward to do. Um, they've been great to work with. If you're thinking about um, uh, streaming an event or uh, doing, doing some meetings, whatever, whatever it might be, uh, give them a call or go to their web website. It's ustream.tv, and uh, they'll help you out. Um, I'd also like to thank Auric. Uh, we're we're going to get uh, Mitch Zukli, who's the chairman and CEO of Auric, on the line here in a moment. And uh, I always tell people that um, hiring your lawyer is a really important thing. Not not s certainly because of the legal aspects, which which are important, but even more important is the fact that you have a great advisor who's working with you, who's seen so many more investments and uh, transactions than you've seen. And uh, I've worked with Mitch and the team over there for a number of years uh, on previous companies as well as now with Founderline, and th they're the best. So make sure you get a great lawyer who can help you out, who can offer you advice, and uh, you can find out more about Auric by going to their website. It's, uh, it's auric.com. So um, with that, we're going to uh, turn to a segment we call Ask the Lawyer, and hopefully... Um, we're going to have uh, Mitch Zukli here on the line. Mitch is the chairman and CEO, as I mentioned. Uh, Mitch, we're, we're over here in London. Uh, how are you today? Doing great, Joe. How are you? Great. Well, and, and the most amazing part is that this technology is actually working right now. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm glad we were able to, uh, to patch you in remotely. And uh, today I thought we would... Um, uh, g given the the uh, the tone of this conversation about uh, y European companies and startups and entrepreneurship, as well as what's going on in America, 
I thought we could talk a little bit about um, companies coming from the U.S. who maybe uh, want to do business in Europe. And so, Mitch, maybe you can um, start us off just by talking about uh, some of the things, the considerations that a company from the U.S. might want to think about as they are coming to Europe, and then we'll uh, we'll get some thoughts from Roberto as well after you uh, after you uh, share your thoughts. You bet, Joe. And I think, by the way, Roberto hit the nail on the head when he described that what, what's most important is to think about what makes sense for the business. Don't let some geography or geographic concern be the uh, tail that, that wags the dog. Think about what makes sense for your business, and then think about how to, uh, how to adjust around the slightly different rules that will apply. The most significant thing to get used to in dealing with uh, European businesses is that there are very different privacy rules that apply. That applies to you whether you're doing business there or whether you have a presence there. And it's just one important thing to pay attention to that people have background on. Lawyers know all about this stuff. The second thing I think to pay attention to is the issue of, of, of actually expanding in the area. If you choose to actually get an employee on the ground in the UK or elsewhere in Europe, you got to start to make a couple, couple, you have to be thoughtful about it because it can have meaningful uh, tax consequences for you. And you have to think about how to set yourself up. Any competent lawyer can help you do that. That's not, not worth going through the details of that right now. But also, it's really important to understand that hiring and firing people is very different in jurisdictions outside the United States. The concept of at-will employees is not something that really applies uh, in the same way that we think about it here. There's often a period of six months of, tr of a trial period where you can hire somebody and try them, but after that, you basically can't fire somebody just because uh, you're out of money or something like that. So that's a big difference, and it's something you have to be knowledgeable about before you go ahead and actually take that step. Let me pause there and see if Roberto has additional thoughts. Yeah, what do you think? Does that sound... Uh... Well, I mean, I think you just uh, catch some of the biggest uh, um, points to, to, to think about. Um, you know, I'm not sure... The, I, I go back to what I said at the beginning, right? If I always find funny when an American company think about, okay, let's go to Europe. Like if it's a such thing as, you know, here I go to Europe. A right? single think, place, yeah. right? Uh, I think the question is, you know, what's your European deployment strategy? Which countries are we talking about? Because, because of what you just said, right? The, the truth is, do that, you know, do an expansion in Germany is very different to do an expansion in the UK. But, you know, it's not only from a legal standpoint. It's also true from a cultural standpoint. Message is different, you know. How people relate to things may be different. Yeah. Um, the overall, uh, um, you know, a product might work in a place, might not work in a, in, a, in a different place. I really think you you need, as an entrepreneur, the moment in which you look at Europe as a potential expansion, ask yourself. Uh, you know, strategically, what are the implications for my business? And, you know, I think the legal ramifications, uh, what you just described, are for sure some very important ones, but there are tons of ramifications for all the different functions of the business. Yeah, makes sense. All right, great. Well, Mitch, um, any, uh, any closing thoughts? I think Roberto has it exactly right. And uh, the other thing I'd say is, while there, next to Roberto, make sure to uh, enjoy some non-flabby wines, Joe. <laughs> non-flabby wines. <laughs> I don't know what that is. What, what, is, what is a non-flabby <laughs> wine? I just made reference to, uh, to American wines as flabby. I yeah. don't say that. For a long time of my life, I knew uh, American wines much better than Italian wines. So that was yeah. quite a big disappointment for my family. I'm, I'm an equal <laughs> opportunity wine drinker. So uh, <laughs> as, as long as it's a good big red, I, uh, you know, Bordeaux, uh, Cabernet from Napa Valley, I, I don't really mind. So. I actually love, uh, just uh, for the records, my favorite wine is a Zinfandel. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there's some amazing <laughs> Zins uh, back in that, the States uh, as well. Yeah, no, no, that's exactly my point. Well, well, we'll bring you back some uh, some European wine, Mitch, and uh, make <laughs> sure you can uh, sample some of the good stuff <laughs> instead of the uh, garbage we drink back at home, apparently. <laughs> All right, Joe, sounds great. We'll talk to you guys in a week. All right, thanks so much, Mitch. Ciao, Mitch.
That's uh, Thank you, that's bye. that's Mitch Zukli from Oric. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. And once again, if um, you want to reach us, uh, give us a call one eight four 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 founder uh, from the U S. from Europe six zero two one six zero two seven five three one six two eight. Email help at founderline.com or uh, tweet to at founderline. I'm sure I'm going to get in big trouble with the wineries back home. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm a I'm a California red guy. So uh, but I, 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 I think, uh, despite the jokes, just to give you how I, I actually do believe that uh, you know the US on wines is very important. Actually, the CEO of Vivino company started in Copenhagen. Yeah. Actually, he moved to the Bay Area. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And the company is running from there now? Well, it's basically a bit there, a bit here. Oh, right? I see. This is a model that we see a lot of yeah. it. And, uh, you know, I'll give you another example. Another company in, uh, in Sweden, a Ticktail, that, you know, started as a, you know, European company out of, you know, Stockholm. Actually, recently, also the CEO has been moving to New York uh, because it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Right? For what they're doing. For what they're doing, the problem they're trying to solve. So they keep the technology team again, that was already built in place. and Again, you know, we believe or not, it depends. Oh, yeah? It depends on the specific of the company. In these two example, in, in the example of Vivino, the whole product team is actually has been, uh, is built here, while if we should say it's a marketing dimension, is more built in the U.S. In the example of Ticktail, you know, they might be some element of the product that we actually looking at uh, potentially do also out of the New York office. Got it. Yeah, it's interesting. There's so many so many variables. Uh, it's crazy. So let's uh, let's dive back in some questions here. We have um, we have an email from one of our regulars. We have a regular. So uh, uh, Larry from Yuba City, who uh, who writes in frequently. Um, With your experience on both continents, what lessons have you learned in Europe? that you think we need to learn in the United States? Yeah, I mean, I think a bit of uh, what I've been touching on is, uh, you know, diversity and be able to deal with diversity. I will never forget the time I was in the US, it was very young, the first time, one of my first meeting, I ended up into a meeting which there was a big pie chart on, uh, you know, on the projector with the domestic, non-domestic market. <laughs> That's it, huh? <laughs> so I, I, I think, uh, again, uh, you know, just think very hard about the differences because, uh, you know, if you are an Irish entrepreneur or, uh, you know, a Swedish entrepreneur or a Finnish entrepreneur, you think global, global from day one. You are somehow forced to be a global citizen because your market of reference is so small, you know, you never build a very large business. So, you know, you need to think about, okay, the world is my market in the world in which market I focus. And I think this is, a, you know, something that is part of the European DNA and I think is a little bit f more far apart from, from the American entrepreneurial yeah. DNA. Usually it's get it working, you know, in one place and then, and then we'll worry about that later, you know. Yeah, and then doing this thing of um, internationalization. I never understood it. Yeah, know. what is that? What's a VP of international? <laughs> I, never, I, I find it a bit interesting approach. Yeah. I think you know. I remember maybe 10, 15 years ago that was more popular. Yeah. And uh, uh, now it's very, it's very specific. Like there, there might be a GM for Europe, right? And and even that is a complicated role. So like, what does that mean, you know, GM? Maybe it's a sales role. I mean, again, it, it depends. Yeah. But you need to agree with me how a lot of this has been changing in the last 15 oh, years. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. I'll It, give you an example, just to give some substance around some of these discussions. So, you know, I am an investor in a company in Berlin called VUGA. I think they have about 300 people in Berlin. They speak German. Well, in the company, they speak English. And I would say, I don't want to tell you wrong numbers, but, you know, more or less, I would say out of the 300, maybe 200, they are not Germans. They hmm. actually moved to Berlin to join Ruger from, you know, it's like a United Nation in terms of really? from many different countries. Wow. And in the company, you know, you go inside, you will never realize where you are. I mean, everything is in English. They speak only English, they write only English. It's like you go inside and say, I could be very well in uh, South Market and uh, I would never realize the difference. Wow. I don't think this was, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I, 
I don't think you will see a lot of that. Yeah, happen. yeah. No, that's very cool. I like it. All right. Well, we got um, here's another related one. This is an email from Jeremy. How different is it working in a European startup versus a Silicon Valley startup? In the U.S., it is our perception that Europeans have a bit more work-life balance, and I'm wondering if that is true with startups. So, you know, in the in the Valley, you know, most companies work-life balance is kind of a mythical thing that yeah. it doesn't doesn't really exist. You work a lot, uh, maybe not so much sleeping under your desk uh, like in some cases in the past, but. Uh, you know, we've always been jealous uh, of uh, Europeans. You know, they seem to enjoy their vacations more. They actually take vacation time instead of saving it up all the time. So, uh, how how is it different uh, working in the companies? Uh, again, I, I make this argument. I don't know exactly what the European means because I think if you compare somebody in Spain with somebody in Germany, the cultural differences are so. Broad, I mean, so huge and so different that I'm not sure how, you know, I can normalize around something. Um, for sure, one thing is true, right? There is, uh, um, in, in Europe, I think people believe that, uh, you know, three, four weeks of vacation in a year, it's not a sin, it's part of life. Yeah. Because yeah. the idea is that you work, that you be on, you know, and then you also have vacation, and the fact that you're on vacation doesn't mean you need to develop a sense of guiltiness around that, right? However, you know, at the same time, you know, if I think about some of um, the entrepreneurs with whom I'm working, they work like crazy, right? Because they are in a very important juncture of the life, uh, you know, cycle of the company. And uh, yes, they could get three, four weeks of vacation, but they get, you know, one or two because they just don't have the time. So um, I think a lot depends on the people. It depends on the culture of the people. It depends on where they are in their life depends on where the company is in the life cycle and also depends on the country. Um, so again, I'm afraid that there is no like a general formula that I can apply. Okay. Sounds good. All right, let's, um, let's move on. We have a, an email here from Nigel. Um, how do investments and term sheets differ in Europe and the US? We're getting a lot of comparing and contrasting. No. Uh, so I, I think that's an interesting question because we even see it you know, a difference between New York investors and Silicon Valley investors in terms of how they how they construct financings and term sheets. So, so Boulderton Capital started in 2000 as Benchmark Europe. That's right. So if you wish our DNA as a firm, also just in terms of the, the legal infrastructure, you know, the, the original term sheets and everything has been quite US centric. And so I, I, I'm not, again, I'm not sure there is such thing as a European investor because I think you know you, uh, we are quite different from what could be you know an investment, a small investment firm, I don't know in Italy or somebody else France, in Sweden or in else. France and so on. Um, for us, uh, I, I don't think there is pretty much any difference. So you you like I to keep it you, very yeah, clean, very and vanilla, as uh, simple as possible. Also because to be honest with you, if the company goes well and you want to expand, they give you you know. The tick tail example, but I can give you many others. Uh, um, we might have value also in bringing in a US co investor. So we want to just have the most vanilla, basic, uh, you know, legal framework so that we can do that without uh, any headache. So I don't see lots of differences. Well, obviously, I see the differences. There are less VC firms. So if you wish, maybe a competition might be less. Uh, um, Develop it. There will be just a bit less competition, right? If I am an entrepreneur in uh, in the Bay Area, I have you know what three, four hundred VCs that I can go and visit. In right. Europe, you have a little bit less than that, and again, also quite geographically fragmented. Some of them might not just make sense for you because geographically are not the right fit. Um, so I think it's more function of again the size and the fragmentation of the ecosystem more than anything else. All right. I don't think you would see any difference between a term sheet from us and one from um, any well, tier one of VC firm. And, uh, and you, you're also investing, like you know, Banjo's Redwood City. So right. if you were competing with anybody, I don't know if you were, but yeah. you're competing against Standard. similar, maybe maybe against Benchmark, you know, yeah. lo locally, right? Yeah. So it could be could be anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense. Uh, all right. Uh, here's here's another one from uh, Tom. 
It says, we are a U.S. consumer internet startup and thinking of expanding to Europe. So once again, expansion. Uh, what approach would you recommend? Hiring someone local to each country, working with an agent or a marketing company in specific countries, something else. So it probably depends somewhat on what their product is and what they're doing. Right, I what's know the business? We keep what's saying the, the same thing. You can uh, say the same thing. And uh, you know, I have, do have a view, a view about agents in general. Would you outsource uh, your development team? You, probably not. Why would you outsource your routes to market? Yeah. They seem quite core to, to what you do, right? So just because it's a different geography, then maybe it's not a priority right now to get into that geography. So in terms of methodology, I would say I'm a big believer that uh, as everything in a company, if that is core to the business, I would recommend that you go and do it. Then the way and the how uh, and when, I think that depends from a lot of specificality on the business. Makes sense. And I, you know, I would, I would tell people, um, if, you're, if you're thinking of doing that, one thing to consider is maybe if you get an investor who's from Europe, they can help make recommendations about, uh, oh, we know this great you know, salesperson for France yeah. or for Italy or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and th they have much better network here than you might have. Yeah. So, so I think that's it. that is a smart way. And that's the, goes both ways, right? It goes for us too, right? If we want, if uh, at some point during the life cycle of the company, we think the U.S. is an important strategic uh, level of growth, you know, I always try to say, okay, this is true. Maybe I want to have a U.S. co-investor that could help me in the company building process to attack the U.S. market. Right. And it's true maybe also the opposite way, right? If it's a U.S. business in which suddenly, you know, look at Europe as a potential opportunity, then, um, you know, it may make sense to think about a European investor as somebody that could help in, in that process. Because you do have an element of company building and you know, logger support might be helpful. Absolutely, and I, I know in my case um, that's that's helped in the past. So um, definitely worth worth looking at. Um, all right, so we've got another email here from Anna. It says there seems to be little collaboration between the U.S. startup community and the European startup community. And again, I don't know if there is a European startup community, but her question is why is that? And what can be done to change that? I know, you know, there are a number of um, conferences now. The web uh, has come over here. A um, uh, number of startup weeks that are that are running. So, um, do do you see that? Do you see that there's not a, a lot of uh, connection between the two, or has has the internet sort of leveled the playing field? And and it's so, so. Let me give you an example. Let's think about that because it'll be specific probably is better. Yeah. So I give you the example of Vivino. It seems a, to me a quite close collaboration to the U.S. ecosystem. Right. This guy was in Copenhagen, built a company there. Some point decided to move to the U.S. He started building a team there. What does he get closer than that? Yeah. Let's talk about Ticktail. As I mentioned, you know, the guys are Thrive invested, CEO is moving to New York, some pieces of the company we built in New York, some others we built in um, Stockholm. But you think about, you know, Vuga, you know, a gaming company, you know, I would say a big, big significant percentage of the customers are, you know, American users. I think about, you know, a SaaS company, you know, Contentful, based in Berlin. You know, they're just starting now, but it's, you know, the old initial customers, they see almost all of them coming from the U.S. So the beautiful thing of think what we are going through now is really believe that these boundaries, you know, these, they really only exist in the mind of people that want to provide visas. Yeah. More than yeah. In, the, in the minds of... The of government bu bureaucracy. Yes, bureaucracy right? obviously more than in the minds of entrepreneurs. Yeah. And entrepreneurs goes where they think the business is. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. For us on our side, just to be, be clear about that, right? So our asset, you know, where we are good, bolder to capital is Europe and understanding of Europe, right? So we are never going to go, you know, in the U.S. Uh, doing investment right and left to compete with, uh, you know, everybody else. We will, because it will not make any sense for us. Right. right? Our specific, you know, our uniqueness is a, a deep understanding of the European market and a capability to help the company doing the, you know, doing the building phase, you know, knowing the European ecosystem. I, I'm curious. Uh, 
how how do the uh, VC firms here interact? Is, is it mostly? It's probably a small community, right? Smaller than the states. Yeah, it's it's smaller than the states, but I think it's very similar like in the states, right? In some cases, we you know compete like crazy on a term sheet. In some other cases, you know, we have fantastic friends. So we all co investors um, together. Um, so pretty similar. I, I don't see any difference. Yeah. The only difference is probably the numbers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense. Okay. All right, uh, we have another question here from Craig uh, that says, products designed and built in the US oftentimes have characteristics that should be tweaked when introduced into other markets. What are some of the product changes we should plan for when we introduce a product into Europe? Is it necessary to have a development team or teams in Europe to handle these? So similar to some of the other things we've no, talked it, about, it right? No, it is super tough to say without knowing the product. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, the I think, uh, um, obviously, there are some layers of technology where you need to think that through. Um, some cases, because of some legal implication, I think privacy is one. And what we discussed before, payments maybe is a different one, you know, which payment systems in different countries and so on. Um, but again, I, I really encourage to approach this problem a little bit more structurally, thinking about the strategic dimension of expanding to a new geography and the implication across all the organization, which product is one piece of the organization, right? Yeah. I don't yeah. think I mean, One thing that is interesting, I want to bring it up, that I think, you know, it's an area where Europe has a lot to catch up. If I think about the last 15 years and all the learnings, you know, that has been happening in Europe and compared with the U.S., you know, an area where I still feel there is a great area potential of improvement in Europe in terms of learnings from the U.S. is actually um, the product development dimension of it. Hmm. Um, you know, if I compare engineers in Europe and I compare with them in the Bay Area, um, I, I'm not sure there is such a big difference of talent. There might be difference of expertise and experience, right? There are obviously less companies, so there are less engineers in Europe that have been able to deal with some of the scalability issues of companies like Facebook or Google. So that obviously does an implication. But the practice of product design, I think it's an area where um, the Bay Area, especially from a consumer internet standpoint, has got a quite uh, unique dimensions where a lot could be learned here in Europe. And um, I think in that perspective, also a significant role is played by education. Hmm. You know, I really think that uh, the ecosystem around Stanford has been uh, um, a quite unique uh, dimension to, to help entrepreneurs to build better products. And that, I think, is true, you know, for, in the areas of, for sure, is very true in the area of consumer internet, right? I would, um, I would agree. So yeah. how can we, in Europe, you know, learn how to build better products? And, and where do we study to learn it? I think it's an interesting question, right? Makes sense. All right, uh, here's a question from Jackie. If I'm looking to join a startup in London or Europe, what are some of the hottest, most rapidly growing companies right now? So, of course, That's all easy. of your companies. Just right? go portfolio, Balderton. Uh, yeah, yeah, come on, come on. <laughs> and <that's it. laughs> Let's see if you can name one outside of the Balderton portfolio. Oh, that's, it's like, you have, uh, you have kids, right? Yeah. So which ones of you, not kids, would you like to have as a kid? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you asking me Oh, to there's that? a bunch of, oh, a oh, bunch oh. of them. <laughs> a bunch of them, yeah. Well, I think I think Jackie might be looking for a job. So, okay. uh, any well, like what's you know like Uber is really hot in the states right now, growing like crazy, high valuations. Lots of people want to work there. Airbnb, you know, uh, lots. Of, uh, they're, they're maybe Facebook and and Twitter and some of the more established companies are less hot right yeah. now. So uh, I don't know. Look, I, honestly, I think there is a lot going on. Again, also depends uh, which position she looking for. Or, yeah, you know, is uh, you know in marketing, is in engineering. With what's the passion that the Jack has got from a product standpoint? Is something that uh, I, I, I don't believe that people should go and work for a hyped company. I think people should go for work in company where they feel an element of connection with it. 
it. Yeah, they're passionate there about it. There's passion about yeah. it. Because, yeah. you know, otherwise, go work for a startup or go work for Goldman Sachs, it becomes the same, right? Yeah. How, how do how do people find jobs here? Like like is it the same? Is it on uh, Craigslist network, and network connections? Yeah. Again, I, if you ask me, the, the smartest they they look for something. They know what they want. And they you know connect and network to to look for something. I make a big deal of always giving two three meetings a week to people that I think have high potentials. Oh yeah, just. You Just meet them, you, you, you know, file it away, yeah. and maybe someday some you need somebody. Some of them one day become entrepreneurs and they may give you money. Some of them, you know, they become just somebody that I may want to place in one of my companies. You know, I'm very... Talent, obviously, is the most, one of the most important things in this industry, right? Absolutely. All right, uh, here's one from uh, Tom. It says, one of the hardest things about starting a company in Silicon Valley is finding and hiring technical people. How does London compare? Do they end up doing develop development in Eastern Europe? Interesting question. So I think the situation in London is better than in, uh, uh, in the US from a co of the Bay Area, the US is a different world from a competition standpoint. So oh, yeah. if you want to put your eyes into an engineer, you probably have less of three, four, five different companies trying to competitively to, to get to the same person. Um, obviously, you know, I, I, do, I don't like startups that do outsourcing of their development. Yeah, I mean, me neither. I, I, I know there are some, elements, some companies that do that fairly, you know, successfully. Um, I, I just think that uh, you know, creating a company is a, a startup is an act of creation. It's like a pet. You don't know when you start something where you're going to end up. And I think uh, having people around the table uh, makes that creation process significantly easier and better because it allows a serendipity. Right. I might have an idea, you might have a better idea. If we go to the bathroom together, maybe we can discuss that. Yeah, right? yeah. In our way to the bathroom. Well, <laughs> right? uh, right? Or, or <laughs> maybe over lunch. Or I don't know. You know that's 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 a, yeah. There is an element of 7DB. Now, I do believe in some cases where you can have the intelligence in some, ca in some places, and may maybe you may want to use some muscles in terms of you know, resources that you may, in, in different geography. Okay, I can see that as a model, but Again, there is a big difference between outsourcing that development, those muscles, or owning those resources, independent from where they are. Yes, makes sense. All right, we've got time for one more. Well, that's another advantage of Europe, if you wish. What's that? This, the fact that you can have some resources in a country. You know, I'll give you an example. You know, I, I am very familiar with you know, a company that based in Berlin that has been using some muscles resources in in Poland and you know it's very close yeah it's not like uh, trying to do that in a place with the seven hours of yeah. time zone difference yeah. right? or or 15 hours right it's a big big challenge yeah so we've got time for one more we've got about a minute left um, this is a, an email from Alan what are the areas of investment you are most excited about right now is there an idea or an area that you would invest in right away if the company existed so a company you've been waiting for something you you really want to see, uh, or or some of the areas that you like like looking at. So I'm very passionate about this topic. I am completely against it, in the meaning that uh, the concept itself, I am against it. You know, I feel that the best investment is an investment that I cannot pitch in my mind. And the moment in which I see it, and the person is pitching to me, I say, "Wow, I never thought about that," because in the you know, this is not, a f we, we are not in the fashion business of following fashion waves. We are in the business of figuring out, you know, the special, you know, wild animal in this uh, sea of different type of animals. And what that animal looks like, you know, you cannot know in advance, you know, only once you see it to say, okay, wow, this is something interesting. Yeah. So I am just totally the opposite in terms of my approach. I actually try to keep uh, my brain as uh, um, open as I can and figure out, okay, uh, trying to be always uh, surprised by what I'm listening and never, never try to have uh, the answers before asking the questions. If I do have uh, a sense that uh, something 
you know, I feel very passionate about, then, you know, I go and start a company. Yeah. But that's a different job. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like it. Well, we're, uh, we're out of time. Roberto, uh, thank you for being such a great guest. If you, uh, if you want to follow Roberto on Twitter, you can go to uh, his handle is at Bonanzinga. I'll let you figure out how to, <laughs> how to spell that. This will separate the, you know, the real people who can figure out uh, how to find him. Uh, tune in next week for another episode of Founder Line. We, uh, we have a special edition again next week from Paris. Uh, we'll be live on Thursday with our guest, uh, who is uh, Marie Eckland from Alaya Partners and also from France Digital. So uh, she made a little bit of news this week uh, talking about uh, how she's going to be leaving Elia Partners and uh, possibly doing something different on the investing side. So it would be great to uh, hear from her. She's a great investor and um, very active in the French uh, startup ecosystem. So uh, it'll be a great show. It's next Thursday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time or 6.30 p.m. Paris time. Hope you'll join us for that. Thank you once again to our amazing sponsors, Oric and Ustream. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Founderline. Uh, during the week, if you have uh, questions you want to send in, you can tweet or email to help at founderline.com. You can also go to our website and uh, subscribe to email updates. We'll let you know about uh, upcoming guests. Uh, you can watch all of the previous episodes that are up there. and. Um, you can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Thanks for watching and uh, joining us here in London today. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again next week from Paris.